Hello, a very good evening to you and welcome to Wednesday's Cross Question. Uh, with me on the panel this evening, to my left, we have Wendy Chamberlain, Liberal Democrat MP for North East Fife and the party's chief whip. We have Paul Scully, Conservative MP for Sutton and Cheam and Tech and the Digital Economy Minister at the Department for Culture. No, it's now it's not culture media, it's digital, digital culture, culture media. Sport. Sport. I can't, it's an I can't keep up with these things. Um, to my right, making her debut is Satvia Kaur, Labour leader of Southampton City Council. She's a candidate, presumably in Southampton for the election. <laughs> and Tony Dimer also making his debut on the programme, acting political editor of the Sunday Telegraph. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. You can text 84850 or you can use Alexa to send your question to us. Just say, Alexa, send a comment to LBC and of course we'd love you to watch us on Global Player Call 0345 6060 973 Tweet at LBC Text 84850 Cross Question With Ian Dale This is LBC now, if you're watching the programme, you can now see me put a badge on, which a listener very kindly <laughs> sent me today, because <laughs> I keep being recognised as Mick Lynch rather than Ian Dale. <laughs> so this is a badge which says, I am not Mick Lynch, <clears throat> which I should be wearing on every train journey that I go on <laughs> at the moment. So there we go. <coughs> Let's go to our first call. It's from Sean in Concert. Hello, Sean. How are you doing? Are you all right? How are you doing? I'm very Should well. They... What would you like to ask? <laughs> Uh, should the rapist copper get his pension? It's this been is on David. the news that day, there's been coppers on the news that yes, he, he should be entitled to it because he he wasn't on duty. But I think it's an absolute disgrace if he gets it. Like that, there is, I think there is a regulation that says that. But the fact that he used his warrant card to reassure women that he was a policeman and that they were safe, I, th I think that would probably negate that. I think Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, and the Home Secretary are looking into this. But um, let's go to our panel, Wendy Chamberlain. Um, you might be aware, um, Ian, that I'm a former police officer. I served I for 12 years as a police officer, and I have to say I am disgusted and ashamed. I said this yesterday in the chamber at uh, the actions of David Carrick. And, uh, you know, I'm in agreement uh, with uh, the Mayor of London and I believe the government in relation to this, because the reality is there were opportunities to stop David Carrick prior to him being appointed as a police officer in the first place. And second of all, multiple opportunities uh, to deal with his offending whilst he was a police officer. So he was offending before before he was a police officer, he was offending during the time he was a police officer. So his pension from that time should definitely uh, be removed. And, um, you know, I think when we look at this, there have been uh, real failings here by the Metropolitan Police and we need to look uh, for action. At the end of the day, uh, vetting's like an MOT. It's only valid on the day of issue. And it does suggest to me the Home Secretary's decision today in relation to rechecking, vetting, etc., tells you that the vetting system currently doesn't work. And not only that, the continuing checks that are in place um, across the 43 forces in England and Wales and elsewhere does well, we, don't We do work. have a follow-up question on that, so we might, might talk about that in a little, little bit more detail. Now, let me play devil's advocate. I don't know if he's married with children or whatever, but um, say he is married and uh, I think he's 48 years old, um, he would be eligible to retire from the police force in, in his 50s. Um, is it right to punish his wife, if he has one, um, for the fact that he's going to be in jail? Well, I think the reality is, is he will have made pension contributions as an individual during his police service. And I would suggest that potentially there would be scope if that were the case to um, return those contributions. But I think, you know, the level of offending and what we're looking at. And as I said yesterday in the chamber, um, it's really important. Police officers are not employees. They are not subject to employment law. They are appointed. Uh, and that's a via police regulations. It's in the government's power to uh, make the changes that would potentially be required here. Paul Scully, are those changes going to be made? Well, look, I think, um, you know, Wendy speaks a lot of sense from experience and I can imagine um, police officers up and down the land will it be equally as appalled by what's going on. And, um, you know, we've got to put some pride back in to, 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 to wearing badge, wearing the uniform because uh, it, it must be so desperate for people who just want to go out and do the right thing and look after, keep people safe um, when they see this. So I do think that, I take on your point about you know, playing devil's advocate, but I do think that when you've had such an egregious uh, violation of trust, 
um, then you probably should take the pension away uh, there. But we are looking at making um, significant changes. I think there's already significant changes happening within the Metropolitan Police uh, with the vetting that uh, that has been announced, the revetting. I wouldn't say that the um, existing vetting scheme is ne- necessarily um, failing because, um, it clearly from is. what well, what I understand is that he wouldn't have passed. Uh, the current vetting scheme. So he he failed. Or, or he, he he passed it obviously when he was vetted. But I'm not. I, I believe my understanding is that things have changed since then. But this will be uncovered when they go through all forty five thousand offices. You are you represent a constituency within the Metropolitan Police. Yeah, I'm area. the Minister for London as well. So it's hugely well, important. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, how often are you getting communications from your constituents expressing concerns about this? Because I think there are many, many, many women in London who, up until the last year or two, have trusted the police, and it wouldn't have ever crossed their minds not to trust the police. And yet we've had these two terrible cases, and for all we know, there might be some more when these 800 people have been investigated. Um, how, how concerned are your female constituents about this? Well, it has come um, it has come up on a, a number of occasions, and that's why, as a government, we've been doing a lot of work uh, with the police on specifically on violence against women and girls in the, w- within the police, but also um, uh, with the police, uh, but also a wider scope as well, because it's so so important that constituents feel safe, uh, especially, obviously, women and girls who uh, um, some may be travelling through London late at night and they need to have that reassurance. So there's plenty more we need to do. Safia, um there are 43 different police forces in uh, in the country. Uh, I think that's just in England. Um, do you feel that this is something that might be endemic in all of those police forces? I mean... Do you, do you get representations from constituents in Southampton about Hampshire police, for example? Um, well, I think anything that happens in London will naturally kind of have an impact elsewhere in the country. In Hampshire, for example, there's a huge um, uh, fear of violence against women and girls. And actually, the problem we've got is that this system is heavily reliant on trust. And we've heard, you know, from you know, people on the panel, but also, you know, um, throughout when we talk about this issue is that that trust has been eroded and actually that's just not going to come back straight away. And yes, these checks and balances absolutely need to happen. It's kind of, it's terrifying. And I'm, I'm a younger woman, not a young woman, but, um, you know, it's absolutely terrifying that those that are there to protect you, you don't feel like you can trust them um, at a time when, you know, you are scared. Um Tony Diver from The Telegraph, what about the politics of this? Because we've had a female uh, Metropolitan Police Commissioner who was there for a a number of years. We've had a succession of female Home Secretaries uh, since 2010. And yet here we are. And to a lot of people, that it's very concerning that women at the top of politics, at the top of the Metropolitan Police, haven't been able to make a difference to this so far. Well, that's right. I mean, but of course, we expect the right approach to be taken towards women and girls from men and women who are at the top of politics. And I mean, I think it is important to point out here that Cressida Dick left her post uh, as head of the Metropolitan Police in the wake of the Sarah Everard murder and and everything that happened around that case. Um, Mark Rowley came in. His stated aim was to review the processes in the Metropolitan Police to restore that trust um, of, of women and men in London, of everyone in London, um, around the way that the police operate. And pretty much straight away, another incident has happened again. So understandably, people on the streets will be saying, well, when I call 999, how can I trust that the person who comes to help me in whatever situation I'm in isn't actually going to be someone who's going to put me in a position of danger? Um, and I, I think it goes beyond the police. It goes all around the country, like Savvy says, but we know there are also problems in the fire service. There's been a root and branch review of misogynistic behaviour in the fire service. And so I think there is political pressure on, on the Home Secretary and, and a government at the highest level to to review these officers. We've got to, and we've got to work quickly, haven't we? Because, I mean, you know, there's clearly the, the, the vast, vast, vast majority of police officers are doing amazing work and they, they would be horrified to see that their, their, uh, their name and their service sullied in, the, in, in this way. So we've got to give them some confidence that they can actually do their job as well as women and girls. Uh, yeah, and, and the other point here is if we've got 800 officers from the Met mm. 
currently either suspended or on some kind of duties, that means they're not involved in operational policing. So actually, yeah. you're impacting on the capability and capacity of the Metropolitan Police to do their job. And we know that the public service is under huge pressure at the moment. And mm. I think, the, oh, I was, mm. was just going to say, I think the problem that you have, and um, I mean, you mentioned it as well, around how um, every time there's an incident, we do hear from government and we do hear from ministers that things are going to change, we're going to put processes in place, there's going to be reform and nothing happens and then there's another incident and that's not helping with that trust. No, of course it's not. I mean, that's a fair criticism, I think, Paul, isn't it? Well, look, I think, you know, when you look in the Met Police, the Met Police is in um, special measures. We've got a police commissioner there, Sadiq Khan. I'm glad he's actually, you know, speaking out about this now, but we've got to have him act as well while just wagging fingers at, at government all the time. But clearly on this, we, you know, we have to fill that void and, and, and act, and uh, act we will. That's why the Home Secretary has been very strong this morning. Um, a text here from a serving police federation rep who says, once you're dismissed, you lose all rights to a pension. He is entitled to have his contributions returned to yeah, him, but no other benefits. So um, let's take a follow-up question here. This is from Howard in Greenford. Howard, hello. Yes, good, good, good evening, panel. Um, what I'd, like, what I'd like your opinion on Sadiq Khan. Now, he's been in post seven years, and... How much responsibility do you think he bears for the demise of the Metropolitan Police while he's been in the job he's in now? Uh, sat beer. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> he could end his uh, career right now. I know, right here on LBC. <laughs> um, um, I, um, I think Sadiq Khan is actually doing an incredible job and takes this issue extremely seriously. I know he's working very, very hard with local police. I'm not an expert on, on Met Police and the intricacies of it, but um, from a politician at the very top, taking it seriously like you said it's not just women at the top it has to be men at the top as well taking it seriously i know that sadiq is um paul you obviously will disagree with that i mean you you are you are i was gonna say shadow minister minister for london yeah. so you you see this on a day-to-day -day basis what more could he have done well look, I, I struggle to actually find an, uh, a single achievement of sadiq khan over his tenure as uh, as mayor apart from wagging a finger at, at government or someone else um over that period so he's got metropolitan police. well he did take leadership in getting rid of cressida dick didn't he yeah and look what's happened to that i mean you know crikey he was sitting there um uh, gaslighting the London Assembly when he had the critical press release of Tom Windsor, who was looking into that matter, when it, um, saying he hadn't seen it, when it was literally within six inches of his right hand. And Tom Windsor actually handed him the press release to show him. So it's, again, it's pushing away responsibility. But he showed leadership he and he did the right thing. Well, um, he he did he didn't act in the right way. I think that was what Tom was. Was he Tom not right to get rid of her? I, th I think you know if you look at what happened, what what the police force actually thought at the time about how Cressida Dick was treated, um, it was. Um, so you it, wish she was still was, in post? It was reactive. No, what I'm saying. He no, was, ask he was, the question. Do you, do you wish she was I'm still in post? I think it was the way that he acted. He was reactive um, because because of a given situation. He should have actually dealt closer with the Home Secretary and actually given Cressida Dick at least the respect that she deserved for the, for the post that she that she held he failed to do that he's there he's now in a similar position with with ULES, the ultra low emission zone that he's expanding uh, and as, as I say he's not building enough houses but he needs to take some responsibility as our police commissioner as London's police commissioner as well as mayor um Wendy I could give you a free pass on this given that you're a Scottish MP and <laughs> probably don't well, I mean, follow the intricacies yeah, of the Met. But what I would say is, is you know, one of the things that we're lacking in Scotland now with a single police service is that three-legged stool of, of sort of accountability around the Chief Constable, uh, Commissioner, uh, central government and uh, local government. And I suppose from the Metropolitan Police perspective, that still exists. And I think, dare I say, everybody then has to bear a degree of responsibility, whether that's the mayor or the government. I suppose for me, looking at it, given that the Metropolitan Police are in special measures and given that they have a res responsibilities that frankly impact on all of the UK police service when we think about counter-terrorism, etc. I do think there is a role for the UK government to be thinking about whether the Metropolitan Police is structured in the right way because there is absolutely no doubt that we are in a position where this is the capital city of the UK and we have a police force that's in special measures but frankly too big to fail. Tony? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there is actually a boring political point here to make, which is that the accountability structures in the Metropolitan Police are not actually that obvious. And, mm. and, and while Sadiq Khan is, is London's police commissioner, he doesn't have straightforward hiring and firing abilities over, um, over, over who leads the service. Um, and inevitably, when something like this happens, you do get a degree of buck-passing between politicians going between Number 10, the Home Secretary, uh, and City Hall, and, and indeed the police leadership. And, of course, the government, whenever anything goes wrong um, with any police services, well, of course, the police have operational independence, it's not for us to interfere. Um, at some point, you know, it gets to a political level and they do have to interfere and, 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 and we sort of go around again. And I think, um, you know, that, that probably is how the system is designed to work. But I think for the public, it's very difficult for people who are have an emotional response and, and feel unsafe out on the streets to watch politicians passing the blame between them and think, actually, you know, are they really taking it that seriously? Perhaps well, it, it's, it's, it's time for reform of a system so that there is a clear line of accountability. It's worth after a quarter of a century of London government to actually test the governance structure to actually, because actually lots of devolution around the country, uh, devolution deals around the country. People are asking for London mayor-like powers. Now, we, we ought to actually test, are those powers structured in the well, right the way? Well, the London mayor that, wants that, more powers so, as well. Well, yeah, That's I think, the I think the Minister for London want powers. I, I, I think let's, uh, <laughs> you know, let's let, let's see where he gets with Mayor's question time after he's misled. Wait, how much um, interaction do you have as Minister for London with the Mayor? I, I have a, a reasonable amount, because to be fair, we do work uh, well together in certain areas. I, he's, he's got the mandate uh, to uh, um, to oversee, you know, that de developed power in London. So it's my job, partly, to give help him have the levers of power in national government to be able to deliver that. But I do then need to hold into account for the government's national priorities. But why are you Minister for London when you're in the DCMS? When you, I was you were... Minister for London when I was in uh, Business Minister and in Leveling Up. It's all, it comes as a, as, as a London MP, does it? Because it joins the dots up. It's not a delivery role per se, not like my um, digital and mm. digital economy, when I'm looking at the online safety bill, about gambling review, about AI strategy and semiconductors delivering in that way, um, it's more of a joining the dots role, because as I say, the Mayor of London has his um, power, has his mandate, as do the borough leaders and the councils as well. Uh, Robert in Norwich says, Ian, it's better to be mistaken for Mick Lynch than Andrew Marr being mistaken for Vladimir Putin when visiting Russia, <laughs> according to his book, My Trade. I'd forgotten yeah. about that, but that's absolutely that's... right, he, he was... <laughs> <laughs> God, imagine the power of, of Vladimir Putin there. Right, let's move on. We're going to take more of your questions in just a moment. The number to call, 0345 6060 973. It's 17 minutes past eight. This is LBC. Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. 
Let me remind you who's on our panel. Paul Scully is Minister for London. Wendy Chamberlain, Liberal Democrat Chief Whip. Satvir Kaur, Labour Leader of Southampton City Council. And Tony Diver, Acting Political Editor of the Sunday Telegraph. It's about, about time they made the gig permanent, isn't it, Tony? <laughs> no. Is there anything I can do as a columnist? Let me know. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, covering for an excellent colleague. I wouldn't, uh, um, I Satvir, that. let me just ask you a question about your job as leader of Southampton City. I mean, Southampton is a, is a big city. What, what's the main challenge in your role as leader of the council? Um, at the moment, it's cost of living crisis. Um, it's um, kind of we're almost at the front line and um, we actually were having this conversation before mm. we came on how um, actually the repercussions of whatever happens in Westminster is felt by um, councils up and down the country. At the moment, budgets are a huge issue, hence why councils are going bankrupt. Um, what we do need is kind of um, stability um, from Westminster so it can filter down the investment that we desperately need. We Most councils have been cut by something like 60p in every pound. Um, it's just not sustainable. Like Councils will go under unless there's proper investment and reform. And I imagine, Paul, stability is something you'd quite like to see over the, yeah, after the last 12 months. Oh, for sure. No, <laughs> definitely. And look, I, I used to be a councillor myself. I was an opposition leader in Sutton and uh, uh, things have got Tougher for local authorities, no doubt about that. Um, when I, I was actually over the summer in the uh, levelling up department looking after local government finance and... Uh, Lucky you. Uh, oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I never really found... it. Yeah, it's about six weeks, but I never really found that after dinner joke that really nailed local government finance, which is why they shuffled me to tech. So now, now in tech, I can get chat GPT to write a joke for me. But the, but no, the serious point is that um, uh, we've been trying to give as much certainty as we can, given the difficult situation we have with the local government finance settlement. Um, we've also been calling out some councils, not, not talking about Southampton, but some councils who have actually been investing in some slightly strong, strange areas, really. That's And that's really come home to roost with some poor investment decisions. That's when people Thorak actually, in particular. Abs well, absolutely. I'm, look, um, yeah, and, yeah, and I, I was um, with Secretary of State and I um, spoke to Thorak and, uh, you know, as we called Essex County Council in to, uh, uh, to, to oversee the change and the recovery because they it's in a bad yeah. position. But uh, we want to make sure that councils can focus on what they need to do exactly uh, as exactly as we've Well, that, that investment will help. I think th the reason why councils have tried to become more adventurous is because they're getting less money from central government, but the need and the demand in local communities is going up, so they're going to have to make up that money somehow. And so, so many times, um, you know, the cuts come from government, but actually it's local councils that have to carry it out. Right, we could continue this debate, but we're going to move on to a different subject with Jay in St Ives in Cambridgeshire. Hello, Jay. Good evening, panel. Yeah, my question is, uh, we trust... Uh, sorry. Uh, oh, we, we trust teachers with our, uh, with, with our children education. Why can't we trust their judgment to strike? That's an interesting one. Um, Tony, let's come to you first. Well, I'm trying to think what you're, what you're getting at there with that question. Is that the conservative response to teachers striking, which is to say there haven't been enough of them who are, who are uh, giving their views on it? I mean, 53%, I think it was the figure that was being put around by the Education Secretary yesterday. Um, I mean, of course, this is a hugely difficult issue because parents will find themselves you know, not being able to go to work, having to organise childcare, um, and that, that clearly is... You know, that clearly is the purpose of the strikes, is to cause as much inconvenience as possible. Um, I think the government is going to have to really sort out some form of negotiating strategy, which it can use in all of these strikes. Um, and, you know, the interesting point, I think, is that the government has not actually faced strikes on this level um, for many, many years. The only person in government who's got that sort of negotiating experience, bizarrely, is the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, who uh, dealt with all of the junior doctor strikes as health secretary and back under the coalition. Um, but the, the strategy at the moment does appear to be the same strategy that the government's used in negotiating Brexit, which is hold back for as long as possible, they will move, they will move, and then eventually come to some sort of settlement at the 11th hour. Um, but I think the problem the government has is you risk empowering the unions if you do that, because you get the sort of copy, copycat strike action that we've seen. The unions are openly admitting that they're coordinating what they're doing, um, and, and you know that risk just dragging this dragging this issue out for, for months and months. So, um, yeah, I mean, c clearly this will be a massive blow for parents, this, this news that teachers are striking. Um, but I think that, you know, there's pressure on government as well as on teachers to, to do something about that. 
And when in Scotland, there have already been teacher strikes, haven't yep. there? Yeah, my 15 year old son was having a long lie this morning um, because <laughs> he has not had a full week at school uh, this year. And uh, obviously, there were strikes uh, prior to Christmas uh, as as well. So this isn't a, an issue that's that's limited to England and Wales. Um, I think it is in, in relating of the cost of living crisis that um, a number of professions are feeling the squeeze. And I suppose the government's response, I think, has has backfired in relation to the minimum strikes legislation because what was the response when they announced that uh, the coordination that you just mentioned has has, has started? And uh, you know, actually. You can agree that you saw that with the ambulance strikes. The ambulance trust agreed to minimum standards, and so it does very much feel to me like a, a sort of sledgehammer to catch it, and actually has not had the intended effect of of bringing people back round the table. The legislation that the government bringing forward are not dealing with the issues now, and and parents, patients, and others are. are what about Jay's question though about we trust? teachers with our children so shouldn't we trust their judgment when they say they need to go on strike well they, you know they have made the decision to go on strike they've balloted and they are go they are going to to do so um i suppose the issue is is why are they striking and why have the government not reached uh, uh, you know negotiated with them accordingly paul well, I mean, first of all, just to answer Wendy's point, that we've always said that the minimum strike, a uh, minimum service uh, requirements, doesn't um, affect this uh, particular action for for any number of reasons. In fact, it actually doesn't s deter people from uh, their right to strike, as we're seeing in France at the moment, when they already have this legislation and they're s seeing strike action uh, across the uh, across the board. But to talk to Tony's point, we do want to work with the teachers. We want to um, be able to, you know, we have an open door for the teachers' unions. Well, they remember Gillian Keegan, the Education Secretary, today, and complete stalemate. Well, yeah. and uh, but this, and, and we have to carry on talking to to try and find um, a, a way through. You know, the, at the end of the day, teachers. Um, Average teacher salary something like thirty nine and a half thousand pounds. There's twenty percent on top of that um, for contributions for pensions and actuary, actually the actuarial assessments because of the people leaving teachers' pensions is that's going to reach forty percent at some point unless we have radical reform there. Teachers are really. Um, are uh, interested in workload as well. That's been something that's been around for a long time. So we need to look at the whole gamut uh, of uh, what teachers well, are offered. But, I mean, but can I just the remind you, you have been in power for 12 and a half years and the retention crisis in the education sector is worse than it's ever been. But to answer to, uh, to 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 answer the core question about trusting, I don't really agree with the premise of uh, Jay's question. Okay, well, answer my question. Uh, so, well, look, I, I think at the end of the day, as I say, we need to look at the the workload is a particular issue that teach, teachers, I think, um, have been calling for reform for some time, and I think it is something that we need to look at alongside pay and other, and other conditions. And I think this is the time to to do that. That's why we need Gillian. Um, you know her offer to to keep speaking to the unions i hope the unions carry on with that but in terms of just the trust I, I, as i say i think teachers at the end of the day they are striking because of their terms their conditions uh, yeah, i know you know everything <coughs> they do should and is for children but the strike action decision is taken for themselves and it will affect children it will they've already had several days off during covid and we've seen the effect of children going through that children need to be in school um, Satvia, when, when you look at the fact that the NEU voted to go on strike, but they weren't much over the threshold, several other teaching unions didn't reach the threshold, is, is there really an enthusiasm for the strike? I mean, I'm, uh, well, I've been a chair of governors for a local infant school for quite some time. You know, um, staff have been really struggling. I completely agree. It's um, it's a kind of deep-rooted problem, but you have been in government for 13 years, so there's no point saying we have to act now. You should have acted years ago with that one. I think it's been a combination of lots of things that's kind of led to this. But also the fact that actually nobody, whether you're a teacher or a nurse um, or an ambulance driver, nobody chooses and wants to strike. They do it as, uh, as a measure of last resort. And, you know, people, I talk to people on the doorstep all the time, and I completely agree with Wendy. This whole approach to, to strike in the public sector in particular is completely backfiring. You know, people aren't blaming teachers or nurses or ambulance drivers and other people striking. Actually, they're blaming the government and actually saying that, um, talking about kind of uh, minimum measures and it's just not washing with people. People are rightfully saying there's deep-rooted problems. You've had 13 years to fix it. There's no point just blaming 
workers that have been struggling for years and are reaching breaking point right now. But it's, not, but it's, but it's more than that, because at the end of the day, the minimum service uh, requirement is there, really there to, to make sure that other people, in the same way that Tony was talking about, uh, are affected as less as 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 um, little as so possible. So why not apply it to teachers? In terms of in terms of you know certain core services, because otherwise, as Tony says, it does affect the the wider economy. People, childcare is always always difficult. But you know we've we've effectively switched off the economy for two years during COVID, and that's had global impact on inflation. It's had a, a tight labour market, which has also um, cr uh, created inflation. The risk is. Um, you know, obviously, all of these factors have uh, have stoked inflation. Inflation seems to, a lot of economists are talking about the fact it's peaked, but there's no guarantee it's going to carry on coming down at the rate we all want it to. We have to make sure that we're acting responsibly as a government so that we're not um, stoking inflation further with a well, Why, why not come rise. to a deal whereby you say, OK, look, we can't give you inflation this year. I mean, we've offered 5%. We can't give you the 10 point well, they, I think they're, they're asking for more than that, aren't they? But let's say we, we can offer 7% this year, but what we are committed to do is within a certain period, whether it's, I don't know, two years, five years, whatever, we will restore your salaries to at least the level they were before austerity started. So at least people know, I mean, back to your point about certainty, at least people know where they, they stand. And I think if there was, a, if if the unions felt there was a commitment on the behalf of government to do something like that, we might be in a very different place. Well, this is what I'm talking about, ha having a holistic approach to talks, because, um, I, you know, I don't know what Gillian was speaking to about the unions today, but, uh, you know, you do have to have a long-term um, plan for, 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 for teachers and other sectors pay. But I also think you do need to include some of the other areas as well, because if you're actually having a long-term plan, yeah. talking exactly as you say, but then teachers' pensions contributions go up to 40% because that's, TPS is becoming more and more unfordable, then that's going to add extra pressure. OK, right. We will move on. Thank you very much indeed for your question, Jay. It's 8.31. News headlines on LBC with, uh, I think it's Charlotte Morgan. As nurses continue today's strike, we now know they'll be joined by ambulance workers from the GMB union for further industrial action on February the 6th for potentially the biggest day of walkouts in the history of the NHS. Health Secretary Steve Barclay insists the country can't afford a large rise in salary. There'll be an inquiry into corruption following a crowd crush at Brixton's O2 Academy in London in which two people died. A number of allegations have been made and the private security regulator says it takes all claims extremely seriously. And the Metropolitan Police Commissioner has admitted they haven't always vetted employees thoroughly enough. PC David Carrick admitted attacking a dozen women over the course of nearly two decades. And the Prime Minister's ordered chief constables to check every officer against police databases. LBC weather, some scattered snow showers in the west, an overnight low of minus six. Another cold and mainly dry day tomorrow with highs of six Celsius. This is LBC.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Well, let me reintroduce my panel to you. Wendy Chamberlain is the Liberal Democrat Chief Whip. Paul Scully is Minister for London. Satvik Kaur is Labour Leader of Southampton City Council. And Tony Diver is Acting Political Editor of the Sunday Telegraph. Well, we have a text question from Jennifer in Sheffield. Uh, The planned online safety law could lead to bosses of the social media sites going to jail for not taking down stuff harmful to kids. But who's deciding what is harmful to children and how? Um, I should point out that um, apparently Donald Trump is coming back to Twitter. It was announced today. Obviously no connection with the question, but sort of. Um, Paul, let's come to you first, as this is your area of responsibility. Yes, so what we have is that uh, the strongest protections within the uh, online safety bill are remain for children. So anything that is illegal, obviously, is um, has to be removed. We have a, a series of uh, proposed uh, priority uh, content that, again, needs to be removed for children, especially these sort of, uh, when you're looking at areas like bullying and harassment and these kind of things, which essentially should be and are in the in the bigger platforms of social media platforms and other um, internet service providers within their own terms and conditions. So that's really where we are are pushing them to enforce those terms and conditions. What we are looking at in terms of senior ma- management liability, the first bit of the question there, is um, uh, and this was the discussion that we were having with Miriam Cates, Bill Cash, a couple of my colleagues, is to make sure that we've got a robust uh, structure so that we can find the companies, yes, and uh, you, you're talking about in the billions. I mean, there's a lot of money, the 10, 10% of their global turnover. But going further, that if someone is willfully disregarding that, um, the, the, the regime that is only essentially pretty well getting them to enforce their own terms and conditions, then, um, then they should rightly be able to have criminal liability as well. For adults, it's slightly different because we've, we, we've taken away that legal but harmful. Um, but who decides what is harmful and who decides who's got to take... Who's got to take so, we have, so, so we have a, a, a list of... Uh, as with the bill goes through, we will, we'll have a list of priority content, things like, as I say, um, uh, that, that bullying and harassment, the... Companies themselves will also have their terms and conditions that that will that they'll have to adhere to. Ofcom will be making sure that they actually um, a- adhere to to that regime. So they will be the ones making the judgment calls. We haven't made it technology specific about how they and overly prescriptive about how they go through that process. Because frankly, by the time otherwise, by the time the bill even comes gets royal assent, it will be out of date because of technology change. But won't they always find a way around these regulations? Because unless it's international, unless you get international agreement. For from all other countries to do exactly the same thing. Surely somebody who sets up a Facebook group in um, this country to advise kids how to self-harm, for example, I mean, that, that would come under yeah. your your criteria here. They, they could just go and set it up in Facebook in Colombia or somewhere. No, because if it's coming to the UK, if it's been, it, it, it's where it's um, it, it's been seen. So if it's in the UK, then it comes under the regime of Meta will then have to have to remove it um, on that basis. It might be a face group in wherever it is. But is, it, um, is this something that they would have to do at the behest of your department or the behest of individuals? Or private citizens. It'll, it, um, well, so so they will have to. First of all, the company will have to have a risk register for for children. So they'll have to look at these possible harms, and uh, and so they can then come up with the terms and conditions and a, a full explanation of that risk register, not just for the children and the users themselves, but for their parents, because their parents obviously can then be better informed, so they they are able to have that media literacy, as it's known, to, but to advising the children what they're getting into and how to police it themselves um, but it'll be Ofcom that will be monitoring the regime and the technology that they're using how to how to uh, remove it they have to have a clear reporting requirement as well but it, and then they have, they have to adhere to it, it. If, if Wendy finds uh, finds I mean she mentioned she's, she's got a 15 year old son and she mm. finds her son on a site that she regards as a site that he shouldn't be allowed to be on beyond telling him to get off the site and she wants his site closed down mm. what does she do as a private citizen? she will have to at the moment it's really opaque uh, how to get in touch with some of the big companies they will have to have a really clear reporting requirement that Wendy can then approach and and, and be able to demonstrate how that is working what we're not going to do is set up an ombudsman um, to look at individual uh, each and every individual complaint that would be quite unwieldy but there will be the ability to have what's called a super complaint so if the regime that, that whichever company is not um, is using isn't working properly 
um, and that's not getting take, taken down, and it's still opaque, then Ofcom can act. Wendy, as a parent and as a politician, what do you make of all of that? Um, I feel that I would end up writing to my MP for exactly. assistance. Exactly, I was just thinking exactly <laughs> the same thing. And, and I think, t t to be honest, and, and I do accept, you know, this is obviously always a fast-moving environment and what Paul says about be being to date, but I think there's no doubt that this online safety bill has been going for some time and, yes. and has been subject to the merry-go-round that we have had of, of government ministers over the last uh, the last uh, wee while. And I think the other aspect for me is, is you know, uh, Paul mentioned uh, some of his colleagues there in the amendment they tabled. What we're seeing from the new Prime Minister is, you know, not to sort of face off um, rebels um, at, in the, the division lobbies, but to um, come to some agreement with them. And I think the danger with that is that we now potentially have a lack of clarity about what exactly the you have the, the the agreement that you've come to, Paul, with the, with the, with your no, back ventures, we... which you say that the things here, around here are opaque, and you know, obviously, I, I you know took my decisions in relation to how I voted last night, but I'm not feeling incredibly confident that to we're not fair, still in an no, opaque I think, position. I think we were quite specific actually, because what, we weren't that far apart actually. What government were proposing, uh, we wanted to make sure that if you're having criminal liability, you you have to have something to hang that um, criminal uh, proceedings on, and you have to, and by having a uh, sort of flexible, uh, less prescriptive uh, kind of bill, unlike the European Union uh, style bill, um, then it's really difficult to actually get a prosecution. So you have to have it, you have to hang it on someone, like some sort of deliberate act. So what we've said, we'll work with them and we'll work with anybody, frankly, to make sure that we get something right based on the Irish model. Uh, and because you talked in about international uh, approach to this, and there are lots of countries looking at um, what we are doing. Ironically, and because as frankly, yes, this has taken a long time. Ireland have nicked a lot of our bill, but it's taken so long they've lapped us. So we've, uh, <laughs> so, but 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 we're there. We're pretty well there now. And uh, but you still got Australia and even America are looking at what we're doing because this, frankly, is still groundbreaking. We are first. We're first movers in this area, so we will have okay. to adapt. If, to we've flex. Been la if, if we've been lapped, that suggests that you know, as Jennifer's text says, that actually we're not protecting children now. No, see, I say to I, I was joking. I was half joking because the Irish. The Irish um, system is is literally being being implemented as we speak. Tony, um, I mean, going going back to Jennifer's question, she thinks that it, it could lead to the bosses of social media sites going to jail for not taking down stuff harmful to kids. Uh, she says, "Who's deciding what is harmful to children?" Well, in the in the end, I mean, it's the parents, I suppose, that that decide. Do you think Do you think the way that this is going to be set up is going to be workable? Well, I think the problem with the process that, that Paul's explained is that it is unwieldy. I mean, clearly the government has to try and produce the most simple system it can, but we're dealing here with multinational companies, with thousands of employees. You're dealing with content that's being posted sort of almost as fast as you can read it, much faster than you can read it in, in most cases. Um, and the system basically relies on a reporting mechanism, which may sort of much, much, much further down the line lead to someone going to prison. The question is, does that actually help the person who sees it in the first place? And the answer presumably is no. And so what the government is relying on here is a system which over a long period of time produces an incentive for these companies to do more to, to deal with this sort of content so that, you know, the, the children of 20 years' time aren't looking at content that children now can. And, and you know, maybe it's not 20 years, maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's five years, but the, the point is it's not going to be, it's not a, a light switch that the government has. They can, they can turn it on and off. Um, and... You know, as as Paul points out, and clearly as everyone knows, these companies move so quickly. I mean, we only got to look at what's happened with Twitter in the last year to see that you know quite often a change of leadership in these c companies um, leads to massive policy changes in terms of what's mm. being policed on the ground. Um, significantly less is being policed on Twitter than it previously was. Um, you know, how how exactly would, would would the government's model deal with that? Does Elon Musk go to prison, and, and how long does it take? It, it, it Tony, there's a layer, to there's a layer before that reporting mechanism because obviously, as I say, Ofcom have to be satisfied that the systems are in place to 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 preempt the, the need to report for for the fact that them to be able to take down those uh, those posts themselves as they before discover it, it before you see it exactly exactly that. But you know, you talk about Elon Musk, and uh, there is uh, an impetus here from the from the free market. We, there was a joke during the rounds that how do you end up with a multi-million pound company? You sell it to Elon Musk for forty four billion. 
billion pounds because uh, you know if you have if you have a, a company you're and full you of jokes do, tonight absolutely Paul. Um, <laughs> very dangerous I'm here, I'm here till <laughs> I'm here till Thursday but uh, um, if you have uh, you know a situation like Elon Musk has has come in and made some rapid changes you've also seen a uh, fleeing of advertisers as well and so those big main platforms do need to have a breadth of audience to stay as big as they are. Uh, ben on attack says, I have epilepsy and want to praise Paul Scully and the DCMS for finally banning epilepsy trolling in the online safety bill. People with epilepsy get viciously trolled online and this will protect them. I mean, it would never have occurred to me that anyone with epilepsy would be trolled online. It's just... Uh, no, and, uh, and some of it is actually awful. quite horrendous. Um, uh, absolutely. And some of it is deliberate. It's, it's, mm. it's really quite horrible. Satvia. Um, well, I'm, I'm listening to this debate and actually the politicians in the Commons seem confused by it, despite you saying it's very clear, Paul. The media seem really confused by it. The people on the doorstep are not going to have a hope in how to know what, what is going on and how they're meant to proceed with it. And that's probably my biggest concern at the moment. But I mean, the principle of it, you think, is a good one? Oh, absolutely. I mean, children do need to be protected. You know, there's, you know, mental health in, in young people is massively going up. And, um, you know, I see it in my nieces and nephews at the moment. And, you know, something has to be done, um, uh, but it does need to be administered right. And at the moment, I don't think we're there yet. Right. We'll move on in just a moment. You're listening to Cross Question on LBC. It's 8.46. LBC. Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. Paul Scully, Wendy Chamberlain, Tony Diver, and Satvia Kaur with a Satvia. I'm going to ask you another question at the beginning of this section. You introduced Keir Starmer at the Labour Party conference for his big speech last year, which is where I first saw you. Um, it was a terrific 
performance. I mean, the That's adrenaline was clearly <laughs> flowing because you were quite, you were quite excited. I was excited, so nervous, but very excited, yes. <laughs> I mean, what, what kind of reaction did you get? I mean, how did you come to do it? Um, I got a phone call two days before, actually, and I initially said no, because I was absolutely terrified. And that's actually my partners that said, are oh, you an idiot? Please, please do this. It's a great opportunity. Um, so, yeah, I absolutely, I loved it. I think my brief was, can you just inspire people? And I was like, oh, my God, I've got three minutes to do that. Um, um, uh, and uh, it lasted longer, which I wasn't anticipating. But um, thankfully, people, and it's a, it's a lovely problem to have, but clapping after each line. So, um, no, it was really fantastic. I got really I great... I got more applause than he did. No, he was... I was sat by his wife, so uh, no. <laughs> um, uh, no, I mean, Kids Beach was great. It was a great... Um, uh, it was a huge privilege and honour to be able to do it. Clearly, people at conference really enjoyed it. I think I ended by um, uh, trying to persuade people to join the Labour Party and get more involved. And actually, um, when I was back on the doorsteps, um, people clearly saw it um, and are getting more engaged with the Labour Party um, and are getting more involved. Well, the great so thing is that, I mean, if the polls are right and you win the next election, there's a big Labour majority and you have all the, this, these sort of hundreds of new Labour MPs. I don't mean new Labour, I mean new Labour MPs. At least he knows who you are. That's well, I didn't even get to see him. I only found out, I think it was like minutes before, that rather than introducing Kia, I was introducing a video that then was right. going to lead to Kia. So, yeah, we didn't cross paths at all, but I got a lovely letter afterwards to, to thank you. I should me. think so, so too. Um, yeah. Right, let's go to another call. It's Chris in Richmond. Hi, Chris. Good evening, Ian, in panel. Um, it's, has, the, has the Scottish Government or the UK Government got it right when it comes to Scottish Gender Recognition Bill? It, uh, are you talking about the contents of it or the bl the blocking of it? Well, I mean both, really. I mean, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm yes. I think has the British government got it right to block the bill? I think they have. Right. Um, I'm going to ask for a relatively short answers so we can fit another question in before the end of the hour. Um, Wendy, as you are our Scottish resident panelist here, let's the floor is yours. Um, well, I think. I would obviously say that I don't think the UK government have got it right here and one of the reasons for that is my MSP colleagues in the Scottish Parliament did support uh, this bill when it passed before uh, Christmas. Um, the reality is, is, you know, a Section 35 order has never been placed before in the history of devolution in the Scottish Parliament since 1999. So I suppose you have to ask why this bill and why now? And, you know, the SNP have been standing up calling this, uh, you know, a threat to, to, to devolution. And the irony is, is the SNP don't believe in devolution. They want to break up the UK. So I think it's a very risky strategy by the UK government. You know, Lord Hope has said, and I know you wanted a short answer, but <laughs> Lord Hope has said that he thinks the Scottish government's chances of taking this uh, it forward legally are, are slim. But, you know, Lord Falconer said yesterday that he felt that the uh, list of reasons that the UK government had given was all so thin, it's quite clear that this is going to go to the courts and that's where the decision is going to end. But, you know, I do think that this is a risky strategy from the UK because anything, anything that potentially threatens the future of the UK is is, is giving the SNP an opportunity. Um, Tony Diver, is this a political issue or do you think it's inevitably going to become a legal one? Well, I mean, it's clear that it is going to become a legal issue in the interim, but I think actually people in Westminster are looking ahead to the next general election and thinking about what the impacts might be there. I mean, you know, there is a divide on this issue. Do you, do you consider it an issue to be about gender recognition or is it, is it fundamentally about devolution? I mean, the SNP have a massive, um, massive political incentive to stoke up tension around devolution and around um, the distribution of powers between the two governments ahead of the next election. They, they want to renew their mandate in Scotland, which is currently very strong. They want to push out the Tories. Um, and, and, you know, there are certainly those on the Tory benches who would argue that's, that's exactly what this is about. I would also say that the Scottish Conservatives had a free vote in the Scottish Parliament on this on this bill and indeed three members of the party voted for it including their former leader Jackson Carlow if they believe that this bill does infringe on uh, UK reserved powers why did they give a free vote in the Scottish Parliament? I would say free votes are a very good thing generally. Well, you, but, but, whip, but, you but from a, but, a whip uh, perspective <laughs> you would think if they thought that. Okay, Satvia. Um, so I'm not an expert on the intricacies of obviously Scottish politics, but I and hopefully others think like this as well. Um, I don't understand how we've got to this point where we're in a constitutional yep. crisis. Clearly, both sides should have known that if we went down this route, this is how it was going to end up. And those conversations could have and should have happened rather than having a big drama about um, this, about the constitution, when actually there's a really important issue 
it within there around um, trans, trans people, people and trans right, which is just, again, becoming at the forefront of stuff and is becoming a, a political football, which is really unfair. Paul? No, I think we have got it right because essentially um, having two uh, sort of regimes of um, obtaining uh, gender recognition certificates um, across the UK does um, does rub up against each other quite quite, quite 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 lit- um, quite quite quickly, uh, and I think this is that was acknowledged by um, the then Scottish government back in I think it was two thousand and four when the uh, when the act was going through when they gave legislative consent um, uh, motion uh, to, towards that bill, recognising the fact that two regimes would be really difficult for employers for, and for, uh, and for and other, in other areas. Right, I'm going to give you a challenge. Chris, thank you for that. Um, the next question, I need 30-second answers from you. Uh, David Paul sends a text in saying, does Jeremy Clarkson deserve to lose all his TV work for one ill-judged article about Meghan Markle? Well, Amazon are threatening to end production of Clarkson's farm and the Grand Tour because uh, the viewing figures in America are very low. ITV say they have no further commitments to him for who wants to be a millionaire. Um, Satvia? Um, I think it's down to media outlets whether they want to abuse Clarkson or not I think it was do you well as a, be... as a media consumer <laughs> um I mean I I don't read Jeremy Clarkson very very often um uh, I do think that people do need to watch what they write and you know it will have consequences I mean clearly it's going to have a consequence on on its pay pack isn't it Tony yeah, well, it's a risky territory getting into commenting on what other journalists are writing. I, I do read and enjoy Jeremy Clarkson's column um, in the Sunday Times and in the Sun. I mean, um, yeah, it, it clearly, it's a, clearly it's a decision for Amazon to take. We don't actually, it's worth saying, know exactly what the outcome of this is going to be but, yet. We, but do you think he deserves to lose his programmes for, for one ill-judged column? Well, I mean... It, it's up to them to decide. I don't. I don't think. I don't think necessarily we should sit here. You're and not going to stab a fellow No, I'm not going to. Uh, Paul. Um, daft thing for him to have said I hate cancel culture in general but the, but actually it goes back to the example that I was using of uh, when we talk about online harms about uh, uh, companies actually being having that free market approach with advertisers because it's the advertisers that are pulling away from this presumably making their judgement. Wendy? I wouldn't necessarily say it was simply a daft thing to say. We started this programme talking about the Metropolitan Police and David Carrick and violence against women and girls. And he was inciting uh, violence against somebody that people have a very strong opinion about. But clearly in this circumstance, the market has spoken and uh, uh, Clarkson would be quick to defend the market. So sometimes you have to take the consequences of that. Right, final fun caller, it says here, from Bob in Harrow. Bob, um, you're, you're going to ask a fun question, I gather. <laughs> Ian and the panel, good evening. Um, Suzanne Jeb, the, cha- the chair of the Food Standards Agency, has barred cake in the workplace. Are we going to turn our workplaces into gato ghettos? Or should we have... <laughs> 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 We're going to be talking about this in the next hour, so joke, don't that go joke was anywhere. Than Paul. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Um, Paul, do you bring cakes into your, for your civil servants? I have brought my entire uneaten chocolate and cake collection from Christmas in, so uh, my civil service uh, uh, my private office tell me they love the cake so we can have cake and eat it fantastic sound like Boris Johnson <laughs> Wendy actually my researcher in parliament is dairy intolerant so cake's not really an option but you know I think people can make their own choices if you choose to bring cake in people can t- take the choice not to not to eat it Satvia cake 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 love cake more cake the better um if you don't want cake in the office don't eat it it can stay there and someone else can have another helping also like if you have a slice of cake just go for a walk or go for a jog afterwards if you're if you're really concerned i don't think you should bar people from having cake big cake fan Tony? Is this the first major political controversy from the Food Standards Agency this year? What else are they going to ban next? Um, no, no, I think people should be able to eat cake if they want to, bring it in for their colleagues. Um, yeah, we do it all the time, it's quite right. Well, don't go anywhere because that is something we're going to spend the next hour talking about. Um, this is slightly more nuanced than the initial stories suggested. I feel a bit sorry for Susan Jeff because I think she has been slightly overinterpreted, but we're going to have a go anyway in the, ne- in the next hour. Thank you very much to Paul Scully, Wendy Chamberlain, Satvir Kaur and 
Tony Diver. We'll invite you all back. You've been a brilliant guest tonight. Thank you very much indeed. So, as I say, we are going to talk about the comments of Professor Susan Jebb, the head of the Food Standards Agency, about whether people should be eating cake at work. I mean, I feel as if it's Groundhog Day here because yesterday, we, we at nine o'clock, we talked about um, something similar where, where people were trying to tell us all how to use language. Did we really need to be told that we shouldn't eat too much cake? That people 